Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's, uh, the title of today's webinar is uh, Medical Legal Collaboration, Addressing Legal Problems that Affect Parents' Parents' Capacity to Care for Their Sick Children. Uh, and uh, today's webinar is all about collaboration. We have, uh, we're talking about medical legal collaboration. We're also talking about uh, a collaborative presentation between two programs, one from uh, Sick Kids in Toronto and one from the Children's Hospital at the London Health Sciences Centre in London, Ontario. And we have two presenters from each of those. And I'm going to be handing over to our close colleague uh, from London Health Sciences Centre from the London Children's Hospital, Val Rusum, who's been a, a long time CAFC colleague. Um, just before we get started, I'll uh, just remind people that uh, we do record these presentations and we do make them available on the knowledge on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, uh, which you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, the page here, we, we will embed the video uh, right in this page, as well as uh, we may have some other resources, such as the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation and potentially some other resources as well. So that's to come following the webinar. Uh, uh, also, as always, we do record all of these presentations, or not, we don't, we do record all those, I just went over that, but uh, we do also allow people to ask questions, and the process for asking questions is to type the questions into the little question box that is usually in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. It, you can move that control panel around, but it usually starts off on the right, and I always encourage you to type the questions in as you, as you think of them. Uh, that helps us, under, uh, uh, that helps me know at what during what part of the presentation the question came in and it helps me understand which presenter the question is usually directed at although we like uh, we often like to have uh, a good discussion between panel members on these questions but uh, it, it helps to start with the person uh, who presented the information to start with the question so um, so since I'm uh, just back from vacation, I actually will do, this is the first time I'm meeting all of our presenters. So, uh, I'm going to be handing over to, uh, Val Rusum from London to, uh, to introduce our presenters. Uh, so, uh, over to you, Val. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Val Rusum, Director of Children's Care, uh, in London. And, uh, I am really, uh, chuffed to be talking about this uh, great program that we started uh, June of 2012. So we launched uh, a new initiative called uh, Pro Bono Law Ontario, or as we affectionately call it, PBLO. Uh, and it's a charitable organization with a mandate to improve access to justice by creating and facilitating opportunities for lawyers to provide pro bono uh, legal services to low-income Ontarians. And the project helps uh, low-income patients and families deal with legal challenges that impact the patient's health or family's capacity to care for their sick child. Um, Hospital for Sick Children had the original program, which we happily uh, used their template as the program, um, as their program is established and, and very successful. Uh, and one of their triage lawyers helped us to introduce the program. Uh, Joanne Chapman uh, helped us also to find the lawyer that's working with us today and I'll introduce her in just a second. So when I was asked to consider this program I remember thinking why would we need a lawyer in-house and I'm sure uh, every director would have that same uh, thought but I very quickly came to realize that um, as the WHO Commission stated good medical care is vital but unless the root social causes that undermine people's health are addressed, the opportunity for well-being uh, will not be achieved. So that stuck with me. And I'm going to let Stephanie and Hannah tell you about uh, how we're achieving this goal. But I've come to realize that this is an invaluable and um, symbiotic collaboration for our patients and families and very family centered. So bringing this service in-house was not without its challenges and our risk and privacy departments were worried about providing a space inside of the hospital and concerned about liabilities, but we were able to work with them to develop a memorandum of understanding um, that defines the guiding principles and program scope, roles and responsibilities, uh, conflicts, things like that, so that um, you know we were well prepared going into this. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have several law firms in London that have stepped forward to provide um, pro bono advice and representation to clients um, that are referred by our triage lawyer. So I'm very thrilled to uh, introduce Stephanie Dixon, who has been a lawyer in London since 2009. 
She joined PBLO at Children's last October. And in addition to her work at the hospital, Stephanie works part-time at Neighborhood Legal Services, which comes in handy, and a legal uh, aid clinic that assists clients with social justice issues. And I'm also um, going to introduce Hannah Lee, who is presently completing her master's in health law at Osgood Professional Development. And prior to joining PBLO as acting triage lawyer in December of 2012, she was involved as the PBLO child or in the PBLO child advocacy project um, as a volunteer and serves on the board for the Legal Aid Clinic Justice for Children and Youth. And she is our partner at Sick Kids. And Jill Sang and Julie Keegan are both social workers, um, one uh, Jill at Children's and uh, Julie at Sick Kids. And they will also be presenting um, how they um, work with the lawyers uh, here at the hospital. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Thanks very much, Val. And thanks to everyone for joining us today on this webinar. I'd like to start our talk by picking up on a theme that Val touched upon already, and that is the social determinants of health. So Val kind of foreshadowed what I was going to say here with the WHO Commission quote. So it looks like we're all on the same page. <laughs> um, so basically, these medical legal programs that we're going to talk to you about today, they've all been founded or both been founded on the belief that a child's health may be affected by more than simply physiological factors. So that's what uh, the WHO Commission is trying to get at there. We've seen already that the well being and health of our patients is indeed tied to social and legal factors, including wealth. So, here in this health and wealth slide, we've uh, laid out some of the um, issues that a child living in poverty is most likely to experience, notably learning difficulties, mental health issues, uh, asthma, and uh, frequent health, uh, sorry, hospitalization. We're going to turn the presentation over to our social workers at this point to describe some of the examples they've encountered um, from the social determinants of health idea. Hi, this is uh, Jill Senga, social worker at Children's Hospital in London. And I would say over the last several years, there has been uh, increasing complexity to the social factors which families are faced with adding challenges and obstacles for patients and parents to care for themselves and their family members. Um, some of the legal problems related uh, that we find are related to substandard housing, employment, immigration, and inequitable social system, which all play an important part of the child's health status as well as their success with treatment. And uh, I just wanted to apply this concept briefly and consider for a moment a four-year-old who is admitted to the hospital for the fourth time in the last year with asthma exacerbation. For the practitioner who becomes curious about the barriers and the challenges that may inhibit a family from being successful at medical management, they discover the following things. The mother has reported no previous health issues with her child, Upon further assessment, it is identified that the mother and her four-year-old immigrated from uh, Afghanistan almost two years ago. She still has refugee status. She indicated her husband was murdered prior to them fleeing the country. She stated they have no family and very limited friends. They are reliant on social welfare. And despite the benefits that are available through our system, it doesn't co cover the cost of puffers, or chamber that are required as part of the four-year-old's treatment. As a result of this, she identifies she tries to only use the puffers when it is really necessary. The family lives in public housing due to limited financial resources. She doesn't like the area as she routinely sees drug deals happening in and around her building. And she's identified that there's mold growing in her apartment. She attempts to approach her landlord with no success. There's no grocery store or pharmacy that's in walking distance for mom. They were referred to an accepting community pediatrician uh, during their last hospital stay. However, it requires two bus transfers and is an hour and a half each way. This poses a challenge as mom does not speak English. 
The mother identified that she isn't eating or sleeping and she has nightmares. She is sad all the time and cries almost every day. This example is only one of the many complex situations that patients and families we serve are faced with every single day. These complex situations require our attention not only to treating the presenting medical issue and offering a treatment plan. More importantly, it requires our attention in addressing the legal, environmental, financial, mental health, and social factors, which continue to cause and exacerbate the child's medical issues and impede on a parent's ability to successfully care for their sick child. Thanks, Jill, for that. And, you know, medical, just coming um, up and, and, and examining that case scenario, it's a perfect example of how we can bring medical legal partnerships uh, together in addressing two needs. And that is first the need to address the social determinants of health and the legal consequences that flow from that. In that scenario, we saw uh, potential immigration issues, definitely a housing uh, quality issue, uh, language barrier issues. And, and that, that is addressed um, through these partnerships. The second need is for people to have greater access to justice. How do we ensure that people um, who have a legal need get access to the lawyers that they do need? And why is this so important in the context of providing care in a children's hospital? Stephanie, if you could just um, turn the slide to number five, you'll see a little bit more what I'm talking about. Um, so we're talking about the partnership model, and by making a lawyer part of that healthcare team, we are breaking down the division between medical and social legal needs with the awareness that they both inform each other and are linked together. And this is from a quote by Dr. Zuckerman, medical interventions when not complemented by efforts to ensure family legal and social stability have limited effectiveness for vulnerable populations. So we're working with this idea that lawyers and clinicians can provide a more holistic approach to healthcare by the lawyer addressing the non-medical problems to improving the child's health and well-being. So at our respective hospital in London and in Toronto, the triage lawyer's function is viewed as being part of children's health. If we can turn to the next slide, we'll see the origins of this medical legal partnership model that began in the States. The first one started in 1993 at the Boston Medical legal uh, center, Boston Medical Center, sorry, by Dr. Barry Zuckerman. It initially began out of frustration he experienced, um, similar to the situation that Jill outlined with a child coming back uh, to emergency, having to be treated for asthma, uh, which was exacerbated by the child's living conditions. The doctor would stabilize the child and the child would go home and a few days later would be back in the hospital in a crisis again. He tried uh, unsuccessfully to address it through the landlord himself, found that he wasn't getting anywhere, asked his lawyer friend to come in, who was able to handle it more expeditiously. Dr. Zuckerman later reflected, I realize that there are a lot of protections and benefits that our public officials have put into Paulson. I thought the best way to address these problems was to hire a lawyer to see that the patient got help to reduce unnecessary preventable illness. And from that sort of insight, uh, this, this um, MLPs have grown quite a bit since 1993, as you can see from the statistics outlined in this slide. Over to you, Steph. Thanks, Hannah. So as you all know, the MLP idea has been a little bit slower to catch on in Canada. The first um, MLP of its kind was indeed at Sick Kids in Toronto. Uh, that program launched in May 2009. And since that time, nearly four years, they've seen over 1,500 cases at that hospital. Here in London, our program launched officially in May of last year. So we're just under a year old now. And we've had 52 cases to date. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, comparative data, in Toronto at Sick Kids, there are 370 beds and a population of 2.6 million roughly in Toronto itself. Here in London, we have a much a smaller population of 370,000, and we have 118 beds in our children's hospital. So I think that uh, we're, both hospitals are doing a great job in terms of um, getting those case referrals and, and helping patients. So who are we? We did touch upon this a little bit already. The uh, program is managed by PBLO, 
and the, both triage lawyers are uh, employed by that organization, which Val mentioned is a charity uh, which promotes access to justice, and it creates and facilitates opportunities for lawyers to provide pro bono or free legal advice uh, to low-income people. So the Children's Hospital and Sick Kids in Toronto are the program sites. This is where the triage lawyers work. And uh, the Advocate Society is an association of lawyers, and they're a community partner in London and the fundraiser that made, uh, in part, this program possible. Our law firm partners are the partners who we refer our cases to when, as triage lawyers, we're not able to solve the issue uh, in hospital. So in London, we have Learners and Siskins, the two biggest law firms in this city. And in Toronto, we're partnered with Macmillan, Torque and Mains, Bellissimo Law Group, and a number of individual lawyers who have joined uh, the ranks to provide services to our patients and families. So at this point, since we can't see you, we'd like to get a sense of who you are. Um, so I believe Doug has helped us out. Oh, yeah, poll open. So if you don't mind taking a moment just to uh, indicate who you are, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, so for those of you who have not uh, done a poll with us before, just uh, go ahead and click uh, your choice up on the screen there. I know that there are often groups of you, so uh, you might have more than one of those in the room. So you may just have to pick... Uh, what represents the majority, perhaps, maybe. And just while people are answering, we've got a, uh, most of the votes are coming in now, so we'll just close this off in another second. But uh, just looking at the registration, I do know that we also have a, an international group uh, out there in the audience. We have a number of people from the United States uh, and the United Kingdom as well uh, who have joined us. On this. That's great. So we've got most of the results are in, so I'm just going to close this off. And uh, there's the results. Uh, the majority are in the other category, but we have a large number of social workers. Uh, providers and management are, uh, healthcare providers and management are both 19%, uh, and lawyers are uh, a small but important 5%. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. <laughs> All right. So moving along then. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about how the program works. As you've already heard, it's interdisciplinary in nature, and it is uh, focused on this idea that uh, we're patient and family centered here. So we recognize that the family plays a central role in the care and health of a child, and so it's a collaborative approach with families as well. So in order to benefit from our program, the child must be receiving treatment either as an inpatient or an outpatient. As you've heard already, the legal advice is free for those who qualify, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, the program depends upon a triage lawyer being on site at the hospital, and uh, cases are referred to the triage lawyer from a clinical member of the hospital. So most often that is social work, the first, uh, first level in identifying uh, legal issues. So, we, as triage lawyers, we see the patients and or families, depending on the circumstance, and we try to get a sense of what the legal problem is. And you've heard a variety um, of potential problems. And so if it's something that can be resolved on site, for instance, writing a letter on behalf of the patient or family, um, commissioning an affidavit, those are things that we can handle easily. If it's a more complex legal matter or um, a legal matter that's outside of our particular expertise, that's when we refer the matter to our partner law firms or other agencies where appropriate. So this income eligibility, we're really targeting low to middle income families. And just to give you a sense of what we mean by that, we've compared our program uh, eligibility to some other legal aid programs. So the certificate program uh, is one where low income Ontarians can receive a voucher, which entitles them to legal services and um, those vouchers are usually reserved for serious legal matters. Duty counsel um, means a, a service at the various courts and tribunals in Ontario. Um, so people have access to duty counsel where they meet those criteria and they need advice on the day of their hearing usually. So as you can see for a family of four, we've set our financial eligibility at about 74,000 annual. So we're really trying to capture those people who are perhaps not the lowest income 
uh, category in this province, but who nevertheless cannot realistically afford a lawyer with all the other challenges that they're facing. Stephanie briefly touched upon some of our core program activities. There are three of them. Uh, the first, really, at the inception of the program, there was a lot of training and going on rounds and educating clinicians with respect to how to spot issues. Um, now we are ensconced in, in the hospital. People know us well in our expertise. So we are asked to speak on specific topics from time to time, such as on consent capacity. The second part of our uh, um, program activity deals with legal service delivery. So that could mean referrals, uh, that could mean um, directly speaking with uh, families, um, directly receiving referrals from clinicians and, and, and giving clinicians uh, summary advice on the spot. If after the consultation process, uh, the matter requires outside help, then the matter would be referred on to a PBL lawyer or another organization like Legal Aid. And those are those pretty much encapsulate our day-to-day -day activities, but we also like to take a broad picture approach at things and advocate for systemic change. Uh, for example, we have a systemic advocacy group, which is a committee that's made up of volunteer clinicians and lawyers from the community. We like to meet periodically to discuss new legislation or focus on a particular issue that keeps reoccurring in the hospital. For example, most recently we identified uh, the three month wait for newly arrived permanent residents as an issue we wanted to take on as a test case. And from the second, the next slide, you'll see the kinds of uh, cases that we do um, touch upon. You'll see they're quite varied. There are about 15 different areas of the law that we encounter from day to day. Sometimes um, our involvement will be simple, uh, such as giving um, someone a quick answer to a, a question that keeps on coming up, or it could be quite involved um, and will require more prolonged um, attention. On the next slide, we um, will see there are certain limits of, in terms of what we can and can't do. For example, because we're in a hospital setting, we can't do any medical malpractice, although we are there on behalf of the patients and do not represent the hospital, we, 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 that is something that we cannot directly help out uh, patients for, but we can provide certainly referrals in terms of um, connecting them with a lawyer referral service, for example, to connect them to lawyers that are not specifically part of the program. We don't take sides in family and law disputes, uh, advising one parent to the exclusion of the other except in cases of domestic abuse. And in those situations, we would, pro we would provide information only. Um, on child welfare issues, we don't represent parents. We only represent the children. And we don't provide um, a legal opinion with respect to the hospital position on, on issues. So for those types of issues, I always refer them and defer to the opinion of risk management. Thanks, Anna. So what we thought we would do now is just give you a little bit in terms of statistics from the first quarter of, uh, of this year. So here in London, we've had 13 intakes or referrals from our clinicians. Uh, as you can see, family was uh, bigger for me in this first quarter. Um, and that usually entails some, some quick information or a referral on to the family uh, legal information centers in the court. Healthcare access has also come up a few times, as well as employment. And for me, other has included um, not just this, this quarter, but last year as well, social assistance issues, some immigration, and, and housing has also been an important uh, issue for me. How about you, Hannah? Well, at the Sick Kids site, we are consistent with London statistics in that our two largest areas of need for legal services are in the family law and healthcare access. Uh, access um, service issues. Because we see a greater number of patients from newly arrived communities, immigration and healthcare access, as it pertains to refugee claimants, uh, account for about 25% of the legal needs presented in the first quarter of this year. So Hannah's going to give us a, a couple of case examples from sick kids, and then I'll follow with uh, some of the things we've seen at 
uh, Children's Hospital in London. Well, the first case I wanted to talk to you about was uh, a case involving tax law. And of course, our PBLO lawyers, when they first joined, they didn't think that uh, that would be an area in which they could advocate for, but, but they, it turns out it is quite an uh, important area. This child had a heart transplant at an early age, an infant, and the parents were going back and forth to the hospital. And they submitted uh, their travel expenses to Revenue Canada, who denied them this as a medical expense and said that they were only visitors. The healthcare team at SickKids strongly disagreed with this characterization because they believed that for a young infant, having their parents there was absolutely essential for healthcare. So one of our PBLO tax lawyers challenged Revenue Canada on this and won. The second, question, the second issue uh, deals with an education law matter that was also um, brought to our PBL lawyers. In the past, children had to choose between receiving education at their home school or what's called a Section 23 school at Sick Kids. Now, the Ministry of Education took the position that to be funded in both places would be double dipping and refused to do so. Now, this was challenged by a PBL law PBLO lawyer through the Child Advocacy Program when the ministry refused to accommodate a particular child who was on dialysis and attending sick kids three to four half days during the school week. The fear was that without having some sort of continuity of education in both environments, the child would fall seriously behind. So the lawyer successfully argued that there was no reason why the child could not be funded as a part-time student at his home school as well as receive instruction at sick kids. So as a result, patients are now able to receive schooling at sick kids and at their home school without having to de-enroll. That's great. So here in London, I've had a few uh, employment situations, and I'll give you an example of one of them. Uh, I was called to a patient's room on a Thursday to see a mother of a child receiving um, cancer treatment. And the mother had received a letter earlier that week from her employer uh, basically stating that if she did not return to her uh, place of employment by Monday, that she would be terminated. And she was asked to participate in a conference call the following day to let her employer know whether she'd be back or not. Now, of course, this mother uh, was spending a lot of time at bedside with her child, helping her through the treatment, and was, in fact, from out of town, so was not even uh, in London uh, living or working there. Um, and so realizing that we had a, a likely case of wrongful dismissal on our hands if this was to go ahead, uh, I did call in a pro bono uh, lawyer from London, and he got on the phone with the employer. I'm not entirely sure what was said, but I think he might have pointed out uh, the employer's uh, legal obligations to accommodate um, and, and the fact that uh, some human rights violations might be in play if that, um, that mother was terminated. So she was not. She retained her job and was given the, the time off to be at the child's bedside. Um, and situations like that have come up a lot here. I was, I've been surprised in you know, the, uh, the few months that I've been here, this is a, a recurring theme. And similarly, with the social assistance bullet that I'm going to talk to you about next, um, it involves a very similar employment situation, but in addition, the mother was herself suffering from a medical condition um, she had developed uh, depression and severe anxiety as a result of her child's sickness. Um, so in that case, you know, on top of not getting time off work, the employer was not accommodating her disability. So we did call in um, our employment lawyers there. But uh, in addition, she had run out of sick time, uh, vacation time, and employment insurance. So she basically had no income. So I helped her to review her Canada Pension Plan disability application and talk to her about some of the other options for social assistance, notably uh, Ontario Works, which is our welfare system here in Ontario, and the disability program through, uh, through Ontario Social Assistance. So at this point, I'd like to hand the presentation back to our social workers to hear about how issues like this uh, were handled before the uh, Medical Legal Partnership was put in place. Hi everyone, this is Julie Keegan. I'm a social worker at Sick Kids in Trauma. And as I thought about um, the situations that we were dealing with prior to PBLO, 
um, and I thought back about them, I realized that many times we didn't even recognize that an issue was legal and did have a legal remedy. And in fact, social workers spent inordinate amounts of time um, just trying to look up um, what the problem was and how best to deal with it or how best the family could deal with it. And um, when in reality, when we got our lawyer, we began to realize very, very quickly that there were often legislation pe uh, pieces or um, policies in place already to deal with some of what the family has been dealing with. So the impact of this program for social work has been that we have become educated. We have become much more knowledgeable about um, what is a legal problem and what could be resolved very quickly uh, with a trip to the, um, the lawyer on our site. Um, and, the, and the problems really, really affect um, parents' ability to stay present with their child. So it's been a real benefit to the families, but I think it's also a benefit to social workers now because we can spend our time doing um, more clinical work and, and helping families resolve problems easier. And the other benefit for families is our families, they just can't leave their children to go and speak to a lawyer. And so the benefit of having our program, whether it's Leanne or Hannah in the building, is immeasurable for the families who can um, just stay in the hospital and talk to somebody and get the information they need to ease their mind. So that's been really, really helpful for the families. Um, and a lot of the issues that um, our families face have already been mentioned before, but um, high among some of the issues, of course, are the immigration. But education and accommodation issues in education were really, really um, prevalent here, and those have been resolved very quickly um, by our pro bono lawyers, so it's been wonderful. So I think also for social workers here, the benefits have been that we are much more comfort comfortable and confident in um, how to determine legal issues and how to actually say to families, the lawyer has said, and we can and give them answers very quickly about how to remedy it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, even walking them down to the lawyer's office. So um, I can't even begin to tell you how wonderful it is. It's wonderful for everybody, and particularly our families who have so many issues going on that, um, that the lawyer can often calm them about or point them in the right direction to get a lawyer. So I don't know how we function before them, but um, we certainly are, um, benefiting from having the program here. So I'll pass it on to Hannah for the next slide. So we wanted to measure some of the benefits that Julie was talking about. And so we did a, commit, uh, a study in 2012 to figure out how this program worked in Canada and assess its impacts on families and clinicians. So Sick Kids, just for some background, is a 370-bed urban Canadian pediatric center in Toronto with nearly 300,000 clinic and emergency patient visits a year. So this slide illustrates a bit of a snapshot of the patient population from September 2010 to September 2011. And you can see from the, the statistics there that the families served are in financial and social need. Over 50% of them are based in Toronto and that that, in other words, the ones that were coming to our program. And of these, 69% lived in areas designated by the city as high poverty. We wanted to assess their rate of stress coming into the program, with uh, seven being the highest. And we asked them to, to rate it, and they gave a pretty high rating of 6.8 on a scale of seven. The next slide shows the impact uh, of receiving um, the service on on the on the families themselves in terms of accessing it. A majority of the clinicians, 60%, felt that PBLO was the first time parents sought help for their problem, and this was confirmed by parents themselves, who were then asked if they themselves or anyone else in their family had tried to get legal help before consulting with a triage lawyer, and none of them had done so prior. So this response is quite telling. It confirms that the project is truly helping vulnerable populations access legal assistance. 
The study went on to evaluate the most common legal issues that were uh, confronting the parents at the time. We see family law, immigration, and education law matters, as we've discussed. Uh, the client referrals came from all, all kinds of departments in the hospital, 22, with a majority of referrals coming from social work, 77%. And the resolution of the cases is quite high. All of them are resolved 71%, with 9% none being resolved. Now, it's important to keep in mind uh, what resolution means. It means the best possible outcome and not necessarily the preferred outcome. And at this point, we were asking families to rate the service. They were asked whether the service contributed to a lowering of stress or worry in the family. And almost two thirds of the families rated the stress, the, the service as significantly improving the family stress. And almost 50% rated the service as significantly improving the family's financial situation. And as we saw from before on the slide, linking health and wealth, uh, that, that has an, a direct or indirect impact on the parent's ability to cope and, and the, the, child's, uh, the child's health. Uh, uh, going forward. Uh, the next slide, we asked or we were wanting to know the impact of um, the, the program on the clinicians. Uh, and you heard Julie's anecdotal uh, and subjective uh, and personal account of how that, that, that worked from her point of view. But from, from the report's point of view, we found that, you know, as a result of the work going in, a lot of them were quite confident. Um, about uh, their ability now to issue spot and, and provide, a, uh, provide a referral in, in, in to us uh, when they saw that the, the situation warranted or engaged a legal uh, uh, a problem. The second point here deals with the degree to which the program made the clinician more aware that the resolution of, a prob of the legal problem could can contribute to the improvement of the child's health. Here, the answer was 5.3 on a scale of seven. Now, there were different responses as between clinicians and the PBL lawyers themselves, with the clinicians here seeing more of a link than the lawyers, which is not surprising, as the lawyers are um, frequently not, uh, you know, they are not as privy to the health uh, circumstances surrounding the children. Now, the report, you know, has some limitations. It wasn't able to, to assess this relationship between uh, legal issues and improved health um, as concretely as we would have liked because there was a lack of data on the kinds of indicators that would show improvement in the child's health, um, medical or health indicators, as a result of accessing the service. And it, we're currently trying to work towards designing a study that would capture this relationship. And if anyone who's listening is interested in, in, in discussing this with me or have ideas, please, I encourage you to reach out and contact me. We're on to the next slide, Steph. Thanks, Hannah. So we've talked um, this morning about where we've been with these programs, and now we'd like to talk a little bit about where we're going. So uh, as you heard earlier, one of the key features of our program, one of our, our main roles, is uh, training and providing information sessions. So here in London, in the next couple of months, I will be participating in a patient and family-centered care seminar uh, it's a full day health fair and I will be there to talk to uh, parents and their children about social assistance and other financial tools for, uh, for the care of the child. We also have here in London a transitional care clinic that has recently um, gotten up and running. And the idea here is to help patients who are turning 18 soon and therefore transitioning out of children's care and into the adult care world. So as you can imagine, there are numerous issues that a family might need to think about when a child has a, a disability or, or health difficulties. Um, some of the things can include guardianship and capacity issues, wills for the parents to ensure that that uh, you know, child who's becoming an adult is, is adequately cared for in the event of their death, uh, as well as trust and um, inheritance, trust, things like that. And of course, ODSP applications um, in Ontario, when a, a child turns 18, they may be eligible for disability assistance. Uh, here, here at the hospital, it's no surprise that um, as a result of our population, there's a lot of challenges 
uh, our patients are facing with respect to the cuts to the uh, refugee health care. As you know, some of the interim federal health program um, basically carved out uh, reduced health care to a whole category of refugee claimants now. Uh, these are claimants who are coming from designated countries of origin. And um, there's a presently a legal challenge being brought by the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers and Canadian Doctors for Refugee Care. So at, the, at our hospitals, we're, we're in the process of seeking ways to meaningfully support this initiative and this, this challenge. And if there are clinicians and physicians who are interested in, in learning more about it and, and wanting to participate and support uh, this, um, please, please contact us. The, the, the last point really has to do with the future of PBLO within Ontario, as we can see, uh, as we have seen uh, in the States, it's definitely become embedded within uh, the way healthcare is delivered. But what's going to happen in Canada, we're wondering. So just so you know, we have heard from the remaining children's hospitals in Ontario so far about their interest in the program um, in Hamilton, as well as in Ottawa. So stay tuned. There may be more MLPs to come. Thanks, Hannah. So we'll leave uh, our contact information up there on the screen for you, and uh, we'll ask Doug to field your questions for us. All right. Thank you uh, to all four of our presenters. Uh, that was really a great presentation. I mean, something unique and different that we have not seen, uh, certainly on, on, on our webinar series before, anything like this. I think it was really quite an innovative approach uh, to, to, to this issue. And I think it was uh, Val, Val commented uh, a few number of weeks ago when we had a, a, a discussion with her about this webinar, about the lawyer being part of the healthcare team. I think that's really an, inter an interesting way, an interesting perspective, a way, an interesting way to approach it uh, that really makes it very collaborative and really integrates that, that necessary expertise in, in the legal environment with the rest of the healthcare team. I think it's a, a great approach from both programs. Uh, we haven't had any uh, questions come in yet, I don't. We don't have any questions in yet, so uh, this is just your chance. Uh, this is a reminder uh, uh, and your chance to start uh, typing away uh, some questions if you have any for our presenters. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has, if any of the, if any of our presenters have any comments to add uh, at this point while we're waiting. Or... Doug, it's Elaine. If I can just ask a question as well, um, a comment question. Um, first of all, I too want to say thank you. It was an outstanding uh, presentation and, and a, a real example of, of some very powerful collaboration between London and, and Toronto. And I must congratulate everyone on, on that as well. Um, just what I'm, what I'm wondering about, and, and I'd ask this to, to Val, to, to, every, you know, to everyone online, um, in terms of, you know, bringing the idea to fruition, making the um, office, the program, a part of practice in London and at SickKids, I'm certain that there were challenges around that. I'm, I'm thinking of, of sharing those learnings with our colleagues online with other children's hospitals, other healthcare organizations in the country, who I'm sure are sitting with us this morning nodding, especially to how did, you know, comment that was made, Julie, I think it was you who said, how could we have lived without this before? So I, I just wonder, Val, if, if you could maybe just bring a little bit of insight to how did you implement this? How did you convince the naysayers. Um, I recognize and absolutely admire the pro bono component of this, but there are costs involved. There are many resources. Can I ask you to talk to that, please? Elaine, this is uh, Stephanie Dixon. Unfortunately, Val had to leave okay. uh, to attend to some other business. What I, what I can tell you is um, I think Val herself, as she mentioned in her introduction, was a little uncertain as to the need here in London for uh -huh. a program like this. And I remember sitting down with her after my first quarter and telling her that I had already 13 intakes from our patients. And she was astounded. She thought maybe we would see 13 after one year. Right. Um, and in fact, you know, it had only been a few months. So um, in, in terms of convincing herself, I think that did it pretty quickly. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, funding or how you make this 
type of program work, all I can say is please send me an email or give me a call at my contact information there on screen, and I'd be happy to uh, direct you to Val and uh, get you the answers that you need. I'm sorry that we can't be more concrete with that right now. Yeah, I mean, for sick kids, I can I can speak to what um, uh, the experience from what I know and uh, about about how the inception part worked. And you know, we had first of all a lawyer in house here who was open minded and willing to uh, go on the phone and talk to uh, the council at the various MLPs in the states to ask what model they used and how they made it work. Because obviously, the first reaction that she got from her um, lawyers was, "Well, why would you want to, you know, let a lawyer lawyer out in the loose, in, you know, in the population? We've got enough problems. You don't." need this and it was through that process of speaking with other um, MLPs understanding that there there is a way that you can navigate a lot of sort of privacy issues and conflict of interest issues and liability issues and 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 the triage lawyer really knowing their role and 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 also having internal help in the way of clinical champions at, at sick kids we had dr. Lee Ford Jones who whose work in social pediatrics was really philosophically in line with the kind of service and the kind of vision that we had and, and having that kind of internal support was was um, just you know we, we wouldn't have been able to launch it without help all around um, so so there are definitely challenges but that doesn't mean they're insurmountable mm -hmm. and and just you know just one more comment on that uh, and I, I very much appreciate your response you need the champions, and I, I, I know and admire Lee Ford Jones so much, and, and I can just see how helpful that was. Um, the, other, the other key message that came out in your presentation, especially at the beginning, was the, the um, profound link um, to our social determinants of health. And, and uh, you know, we, we, I'm sure everyone online is, is very engaged in many different ways in, in, in work, you know, sort of addressing the social determinants. But this legal aspect, I have to say personally, is not one that I've made an immediate connect with to social pediatrics. So I think there's some, there's an important message there that, that just, just that, um, that initial slide that you put up uh, with with this, you know the list of social determinants of health that we're all so familiar with, but connecting it with this topic, right? An important um, takeaway from today's webinar. I I, I totally agree. Um, I think I think part of it is uh, awareness and and seeing that you know um, sometimes uh, it is it is a legal issue that that underlies the social ones or, or can underlie or be commingled with uh, with the social issues and 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 ultimately um, provide some redress to to so that all the other good good stuff can happen you know exactly exactly uh, and just to add to that um, we are in the process of developing something like a legal issue spotting checklist that might be used by clinicians uh, and or social work when they first uh, meet a patient or you know when it's feasible to do so, so that um, some questions can be raised that might not otherwise uh, have been raised in the normal course of you know providing healthcare. Um, yeah. So so issues like you know what is your your source of income? Uh, how is your housing situation, do you have enough money for for drugs? Uh, you know, a whole variety of issues that uh, we'll be brainstorming uh, to come up with some effective questions for for our staff. Yeah, and we've got a similar tool here in, in at Toronto, at the kids here, and, and it provides, uh, after you've asked those questions, resources to, to where you can direct the patient. So it's a simple one pager. It's a handout that can easily be put in a clinician's office and, 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 and basically encapsulates the, try to, the, the service that we try to provide. So we'll, we'll definitely make that available uh, through the website. Yeah, what, what might be absolutely fantastic is if we could take both those tools and actually have them up on the Knowledge Exchange Network with this presentation as a resource. I don't foresee a problem with that. I'll, I'll ask her. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely make inquiries. Thank you.
Yeah, and and whether you send the tools to us or just direct us to to other places on the on the internet, such as your own sure. sites, where they might be posted, would be would be even better. So okay. Yeah, and we have had a couple questions come in uh, in the last few minutes. Uh, the first question was, why do you not cover family and domestic violence? I can, I can answer that question. Um, we 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 I guess it wasn't clear enough in the presentation, but we we cover uh, we give information only with respect to family law matters. Uh, but we we provide advice. We go information. We provide information and advice uh, with respect to domestic. So our our problem with advising with respect to family is that we we might be in a conflict of interest because there are obviously two parties that are involved that are in conflict with one another. And the hospital was very uncomfortable in us becoming involved and taking sides. But where there's an issue of domestic violence, uh, that is a situation which obviously warrants our intervention. And we, we do provide more than just referral services, if that answers the question. And did Hannah or anyone else want to uh, add to that? Um, this is Julie, um, social worker at Sick Kids. And we uh, social workers are also very, very involved with domestic violence in supporting um, the, uh, the partner who is being abused. And we also um, connect them very, very quickly to outside resources to, um, to ensure their safety. So we work very closely on those kinds of cases. All right, thank you. Uh, we did have a question come in from Brenda who's asking, is there a plan to extend the legal services to those families who have complex care, medically fragile children uh, who have transitioned to adult care? And more specifically, is age a limitation at this point in time? So in London, um, I'm charged with the Children's Hospital and this transitional care clinic. So um, those patients would still be in the under 18 world. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing them before they transition, in other words. Um, in terms of expansion, there has been great interest um, and positive feedback. So um, it's, it's certainly a possibility for the future. Uh, funding is going to be an issue, of course, um, but we're definitely open to that, that possibility down the road. Uh, I don't know what talks have, have happened in Toronto. I don't know if, Anna, you can tell us anything about that. I'm not aware of, of any recent developments. All I know is that right now it's a service that's open to patients uh, and families at the kids, and, and I believe they're patients, except for certain clinics, uh, for example, metabolic diseases. I know there are patients who, who can be up to 20 and still be seen there because there's nowhere else you can discharge them. So they would still be able to have services through, through their um, patient status at the hospital. All right. This is just uh, one more chance to remind people to, if there are any more questions, uh, we we are we do have about f five minutes left. So if uh, there's any last minute questions and the fingers are flying on the keyboard, uh, we I think we do have time to take them. But uh, while we're waiting, in the meantime, uh, is there any other comments from the panel? Uh, any? Maybe we'll even take some closing comments while we're waiting for any final questions to come in. If there's any last words you'd like to say. Well, I would personally just like to thank everyone for uh, tuning in today. Um, I think we're all a little bit overwhelmed by the response and, and the uh, variety of callers. Um, and uh, surprised to hear some people in from the UK and the US, so that's great. Um, I'm actually leaving this afternoon to attend a MLP conference in the United States. So as we've mentioned already, um, there are a great number of these partnerships in the US and I will be going down there to learn all about uh, the issues that they're facing um, and, and how they do things. So I'm excited to bring back a lot of uh, tips and knowledge to share with, um, with my partner in Toronto. And perhaps, perhaps if folks are interested with additional partners, this is a topic <clears throat> that we can bring back to CAFC's webinar series perhaps, you know, in a, you know, months from now kind of thing. It doesn't have to be just today. In fact, I kind of hope it isn't. Absolutely. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. All right. Well, it sounds like uh, that's, uh, that's about it. And... Um,
so we'll just wrap this up real quick. And, uh, you know, thanks to our presenters. Thanks to Stephanie, Hannah, Jill, Julie, and Val for a great presentation. Really, as I mentioned earlier, there's some, some unique information, a couple of unique programs in Canada, and, and it was great to hear. And I hope, uh, I hope if anyone does have any questions following this, don't hesitate to contact me. We can always get you in touch with our presenters. Or uh, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, we will be posting this information as well as the full audio-visual recording of the webinar on the Knowledge Exchange Network that you can see on the screen. Uh, we do do these uh, webinars uh, typically Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, occasionally on Fridays, and occasionally at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, but uh, usually our, our usual time slot is Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you are ever looking for any more information about our webinars, you can go to our website under the uh, CAFC Presents section in the Tools and Resources. Uh, you'll see a calendar of upcoming events. Uh, you can subscribe to the email notifications uh, informing you of uh, upcoming webinars. And uh, if you do have any questions about our webinars, the Knowledge Exchange Network, or anything else that we're doing at CAFC, don't hesitate to contact us. So thanks again to the audience for joining us and to uh, once again to all of our speakers. And we'll see you hopefully at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.